Hey guys, Steven here, Fanatic Perspective. Tran, tell you week. Let's get it, man. I can't wait, man. Um, I mean, they they announced that it's game day this week too. There, you know, I'm I'm really envious that you get to go experience it and that, you know take it all in. Uh, first time I went to the uh, Red River rivalry, game day was there too. A lot of fun. Got to meet a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very envious of you right now. Man, that was what 2018 game, right? Mm -hmm. When we when we uh, when we won. When we actually won. So, uh, you know, already a, uh, you know, good sign there, right? So everybody che checking in. This will not be a traditional preview. We're recording this early in the week. Uh, more so storylines, outlook, um, you know, some things we, with some data that we now have with both teams playing five games. Texas coming in the game four and one. OU coming in at five and oh, both teams now ranked. In the top 25, we know I'll use the top 10 team at number six, and we're coming in at number 21, back in the top 25 after our, our road win against TCU. So a lot to dive into. Uh, before we get into our storylines, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, BUSR, the official sports book, the official betting partner of Fanatic Perspective. Everybody hitting me up constantly about predictions and lines and whatnot. Tap in and support us at busr.com slash fanatic. Take advantage of that promo code you see there below, sports100fp. There's a five-time rollover there, but they're still matching 100% of all deposits, 100% free play to take advantage at BUSR, the official sports book of Fanatic Perspective. So, Tran, audience, we broke it down into five big storylines. Now, you guys can chime in in the comments because there's always a person that's like, you guys left this out, or that's why we that's why we love to interact, right? And so these are just the five things that Tran and I collectively put together and identified, and we'll go from there. Now, I think there's one big obvious one that's going to be a, for obvious reasons, a big talking point, and I think it's going to turn into an annoying talking point, but let's dive into it. So number one, Casey Thompson, it, is, it, is this going to be the new uh, Charlie Brewer didn't get offered by by Texas for the no. uh, for the no. for the commentators? No, because the, we we had to deal with Charlie Charlie uh, Charlie Brewer's name for three four years, so um, Oklahoma is not going to have to do that. Now, say he comes in and drops <laughs> drops like fifty on them. Maybe that that might be a little bit different, mm. but but for, I remember his recruiting. I, I think in my eyes, I, I think he, he wanted to come to Texas. So uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't like a Charlie Brewer situation where Charlie Brewer wanted to come to Texas, but we didn't offer him. Um, he wanted to come here. So, but you know, this is definitely going to be a storyline. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. They ran a little segment on game day about this that goes behind his. Uh, goes talks about his father and how he played at OU and you know his his transition to the college game. I mean, it's it's unorthodox, honestly. It's uh, it's his fifth year and he's finally getting started. And in his no, it's fifth not, year, it's, fourth year uh, is it fourth? Yeah, for, yeah, 2018, 20, yeah. So fourth okay, year. so fourth year. Sorry, sorry. Um, but regardless, uh, he got bypassed by a uh, by a redshirt freshman at the beginning of the year and then re won over the job just just by his attitude and him sticking around. I mean it's it's a pretty it's a pretty cool story. So um yeah uh it's it's gonna be talked about because of the connections on both sides of the uh, both sides of the fence. I remember um Jonathan Gray uh, Jonathan Gray him him and his dad whenever we play Texas Tech they would always bring that up. So it's gonna it's gonna be a talking point. Absolutely. And and Charles Thompson was a very good player mm -hmm. for, for Oklahoma and, and had a very successful career in the late 80s. And, you know, he had his troubles in the 90s legally, but obviously, you know, had, you know, Casey Thompson, his brother Kendall Thompson, who I believe started out as a quarterback at, at Oklahoma until he became a wide receiver. So um, 
that that's blood. That's bloodline there. And it's always a big deal when there's when there's a you know a legacy involved, if you will. You see how how crazy we got over the Brockemeyers, uh, yeah. the, the twins that didn't follow their own brother's uh, footsteps in Luke, and obviously their father and their grandfather. And so, but we always will feel that that tie to those guys, right? And so, and, and that tie is there between Casey Thompson and Oklahoma fans because he's almost one of them in a lot of ways. He still he still has that blood running through his veins. He grew up in Oklahoma City, not too far away from Norman, played his high school football in Oklahoma, and there's no player I get asked about more from OU folks that follow this channel for the last several years before Casey Thompson did anything in the bowl game. And this goes to a conversation when I was on RJ's channel last year previewing the game, and he brought up Casey Thompson. And that's not just RJ. That's not just you know, OU YouTubers, right? Like that is a lot of people in the fan base who just know this young man. They just know the guy, right? Just like how we knew people that are legacy from this program when they have kids. And it's like, you know, if Michael Huff, you know, Michael Huff had a kid, right? Or, and, and they grow up to go play for OU or go play for AM. So it's a big deal. Or, or Aaron Ross and Sonia Richard yeah. Ross. Yeah. Right. Right. Like that's those are two Texas people. And hopefully whatever they produce, they'll they'll you know, I think they already had their first child. But yeah, hopefully they'll they'll be Longhorns one day. But for everything that the Thompson family has given to Oklahoma, Casey Thompson's now here at at, at Texas. So that in itself is a major storyline on top of this being his first game. He talked about this week already. Uh, going to those games and sitting in, in the guest suite. And he's very familiar with not just the atmosphere, but the understanding of how big this this game is, how big this moment is. I think he's totally self-aware of this. He's also coming off of his worst football game as a Texas Longhorn. Um, as Sark said, a gritty effort by by Steve Sarkeesian, by, by Casey Thompson per, per Sark. This is a very interesting way to put it, but it, but it, he's right, right? There were some very gritty moments in there against TCU, and now he's facing a different type of test against OU, against, you know, common ground. You're also looking at a situation where OU fans, because we're going to jump in, this, this kind of segues into the next topic. There's a There seems to be something brewing in that fan base, potentially in that locker room, regarding Spencer Rattler. And I'm curious, you know, if Casey Thompson gets it going and he starts balling and Spencer Rattler, whether it's him or the offensive line or what have you, starts to have struggles if there's, you know, looking at somebody else's somebody else's woman, so to speak, right? But anyway, Tran, let's segue into number two because I think this is a big one here. Heisman, where do you want to start, Tran? I mean, we're gonna we're a Texas channel. We're starting with Bijan. There you go. Right let's be answer. honest. <laughs> let's be honest. We're uh, Bijan has definitely inserted himself into the Heisman conversation. Um, I think he's second in total rushing yards. Um, third, third in uh, total yards or something like that. Or, and first in first in yards after contact, which is which is probably the most impressive stat right there. Because if you're if you're still putting up those yards and you're still getting hit behind the line of scrimmage and still putting up these these amount of yards, it, it's it's amazing, you know. So, in my eyes, I I don't know uh, right as of right now, you know, uh, October fourth at ten o'clock at night. I don't know what the Heisman odds are uh, via via Vegas, but in my eyes, he's he's jumped over Spencer Rattler. I mean, in the conversation. Can Easily. I tell you? Can I tell you what Bijan's odds are? I checked today on BUSR because yeah, you have a little uh, prop bet. Our official sponsor <laughs> up there. I actually so um, right now it's plus two thousand. So still th- now that number before TCU was plus thirty five hundred. Mm-hmm. So now we're plus two thousand, and I, I think Bryce Young has the bet now is, has the best odds at like. Plus 140, I want to say. And then Rattler's still in the top three or four at like plus plus a thousand, I think. So 
Um, Bijan's Bijan's his number is coming down. So yeah, if you guys fine. haven't, you know, for for those who still, I mean, plus two thousand is an excellent number to 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 put some money on if if, if that if you want to. Um, I would take advantage of that. Now, uh, in regards to Bijan Robinson on the field, you know, you mentioned it earlier in terms of yards after contact. He has the most broken tackles in the country thus far. That third and six last week against TCU, A, the balls of the play call, and he broke through five TCU defenders to get those yards and to, to keep the chains moving, to get the first down to win the game. I don't know if that's necessarily a Heisman moment, but college game day is there. It's, it's Red River rivalry. We're in Dallas. It's the whole, this is the game where Heisman moments can be created. Mm-hmm. This is the game where, he now goes from, oh, he's in the hunt to he could be the leader. Very easily. Right now, I think Bryce Young would be your de facto Heisman through the first five games because he's the best player on the best team. And nobody else is – all the other big stat people aren't on – either they've already lost the game or they're – you know, they haven't really beat anybody, haven't really had a moment like that. We know the, the running back from, from Michigan State, he's also balling as well. And he's he's right, you know, he's in the conversation. Michigan State's had some big wins. They're undefeated. So he may have something to say. But right now, in terms of where the eyeballs are, all the eyeballs, you know, and I know Iowa and, and Penn State people are pissed off that they didn't get game day. And they're ranked three and four. Uh, but y'all don't move the needle on the television. Just is what it is. And, and rega- the eyeballs are, are on Texas OU. That's why we have Spencer Rattler here as well, because if Spencer Rattler on the, on the flip side of it, if he can get his act together and, and, the, and they look mm-hmm. like Lincoln Riley offense, he has a big day against Texas. He is right back in the mix, regardless of how OU fans feel, because we were talking about stuff bubbling up. West Virginia game, y'all booed your own quarterback. Let's not... I've been avoiding talking about it on the channel because I've been staying in my lane, focusing on Texas. But now that OU is here, let's talk about it, Tran. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about it, Tran. What did you tell me offline? Let's bring let's bring that offline. energy to the, offline. Offline. Bring it up. We, we've been bringing the energy of hey, if we're gonna be called the bad, if we're gonna be called the bad guys and not act like it, there's there's an issue there because if everyone's gonna call us it and we still are the good guys, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. But right now. This is a rivalry game. Use whatever you can to make sure you got that edge. So if I'm Texas fans, which I am, and I was at the game, I would start the chant just to get into his head, put in Caleb. You don't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. You know that's got to be in his head. And I don't feel guilty. You know why? Because that kid's made a million dollars this year. (laughs) So, So I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Um... And it's all within the game. Yeah, it's all within the game. It's all within the game. It's not. It's not a personal attack. It's not. Nobody's talking about fans. We're making fun of actually the fans. We're making fun the of the fans. We're, we're we're trolling the fans, and we're talking about the quarterback. And in regards to on the field performance, and you know what, Oklahoma fans started it. Mm-hmm. Once y'all did that. Once y'all did that. What y'all did in the West Virginia game. I'm just saying, if if if. I, I'm with you, Tran. If if we want to do that energy, we could, and, and start the "We Want Caleb" chance, you know. And, 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 and like you said, it's a rivalry game, and we want to feel that energy, right? And, and at the same token, also be respectful of the opponent because Spencer Rattler, in this very like game it. last year, yeah. had went through a whole football transformation mm-hmm. with Lincoln Riley, and you know Tanner Mordecai is in the game, who's now balling at SMU. And they go back to Spencer Rattler and he's able to win that game in overtime and, you know, propels him to what he became the rest of the year. So we're very mindful of that. And look, he played very well. In my opinion, he played very well against Kansas State. I know there's a lot of Oklahoma fans that don't like the kid. I've talked to them. So this isn't this isn't me just it's not a secret. No, it's not a secret. There's an energy out there, regardless of how well he plays. And and this was stuff that I was hearing. 
before the season started. Do you remember during the offseason, I got asked on RJ's channel about Spencer versus Caleb after the spring game? And I thought it was so ridiculous. I'm like, hold on. This guy is being – all the mock drafts are telling me that he's in the mix for QB1, could potentially be the number one overall pick with his arm talent, ball placement, what have you. And there are – there was a underswelling of OU fans then talking about, I prefer Caleb Williams, who's a, a true freshman, you know, phenom, Gonzaga, D.C., we know what's good with him. So – I'm curious to see. I, I I think, and I'm and I I can't wait to collab with some of my OU f- friends this week. Has that psychological impact? Has that impacted the the rest of the team? Forget Spencer Rattler, because this OU offense has not looked like the vaunted Lincoln Riley offenses we've seen since he's you know since he's been at Oklahoma. So I'm really curious to 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 know what psychological impact that's had. Or is it just straight up offensive line? That leads us into the next thing, though. Speaking of Lincoln Riley. And so, Tran, I think, you know, one may say, hey, it's bold for y'all to say best offensive mind in the game between these two. But look at the resumes between Steve Sarkeesian. And when when I say resumes, it's talking about what have you done for me lately, right? Mac Jones. Tua, you got Jalen Hurts, you know, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield. You got all these dudes and all the weapons, right? The C.D. Lambs, the Devontae Smiths, right? The Jalen Waddles, Marvin Mims now. All the all the ballers, Hollywood Brown. How many we- – Mark Andrews. We can make a laundry list of just weapons between – what we've seen from Steve Sarkeesian recently since he took over at Bama and Lincoln Riley since he took over at OU. And now that Steve Sarkeesian's here at Texas, add B. John Robinson to the list. Because I will say this, and it, it may sound crazy, but Steve Sarkeesian, first conference game in the Big 12, puts up 70 points on an opponent who's not Kansas. 70 points on an opponent who just beat who, uh, West Virginia. Who just beat West Virginia. Yeah. Right? And he's walked into this conference and has a running back who's now the second leading rusher in the country, who we just talked about earlier, who's, you know, squarely in the Heisman conversation. So I think it, this is a very intriguing matchup between these two. I've been waiting for this since Steve Sarkeesian was hired in terms of best on best. Can't wait to see a tramp. I can't wait to either. Um, and th- those who say, you know, the best offensive mind in the game, we actually sat down beforehand and, like, named the others. Um, I think we came up with Ryan Day, and that was it, uh, honestly. Um, I mean, there, there there are other offensive minds out there that are Absolutely. very good, but, but we are going specifically off the resume. I mean, look at Lincoln. He's won six – he hasn't won six, but uh, Oklahoma has won six behind his – but well, I think he was a part of every six, every one of the six, right? Even as an offensive coordinator. So I mean, look at that. Look at look at Sark's resume at Alabama, playing in playoffs two years in a row. He's he's doing wonders so far with Texas's offense this year. Um, Xavier, we didn't even throw out Xavier Worthy. Him pulling in Xavier Worthy and making him productive year one so far. So. You know, the things that things I want to see is like, what what do we have? Because, you know, both of them have something planned specifically for this game. Like, what are we going to see that's special for this game? And that's 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 the beauty of football is that even if even if linking schemes something good against us, like the, we really love that one play that CD Lambs highlight tape for everything that was schemed out for specifically for us. And, uh, you know, I, I want to see what we have to bring to the table for our first, uh, for uh, Sark's first hurrah with, with the Red River rivalry. Tran, Evan Stewart is mm-hmm. going to be at the game. There's some, you know, I, I, I would, There's some heavy hitters. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, other people like Brennan Thompson show up and other guys that are in the mix and other guys that, you know, you know, 2023 class potentially that are 
looking at Texas and Oklahoma. There's no better. We're talking about Bijan Robinson being showcased for, for Heisman. There's no better opportunity to showcase your offense than this with all the eyeballs on there. In Dallas, where we're, tr- where we're you know, fertile recruiting ground. And, and to legitimately say, look, I walked in. Because Steve Sarkeesian coming in, Lincoln Riley has the mental edge over Texas just from the success that he's had, right? So Steve Sarkeesian walking in, it's very important to get off to a good start, just like we saw last week against Gary Patterson, right? Because the previous coaches that we've had here had so many struggles against Gary that it was it was just good. It was a, it was a, a a very relieving deep breath that we all got to take as a fan base beating that man. So now we look at the the guy that has had everybody owned us, yeah, owned everybody in the Big Twelve, right? So if we can overcome that, and under also understanding that this may be a team if if things continue to go the way that they're going in the Big Twelve, Oklahoma State will have something to say about this because they're the other team that's currently undefeated within conference play. But if we continue our trajectories and and, and OU, I expect to get better throughout the season. I I don't think, and this is something we've seen consistently with Lincoln Riley teams, they do ramp. They do ramp. That they could play again, right, in the Big 12 championship game in Arlington. But in particular for this game, I think it's important to set the tone right off the bat for the sake of recruiting, for the sake of you know, your offensive reputation for the sake of Bijan Robinson, for the sake of winning this football game and getting monkeys off your back of putting on a show against these guys. And if you're Lincoln Riley, the motivation is equivalent because if you're Lincoln Riley, you're trying to show ownership. This is my conference. I know you were tearing it up in the SEC. That's wonderful. I'm going to go over there and tear it up too. That's got to be, that's got to be Lincoln Riley's energy too, because regardless of their struggles and what we've seen on tape, He's still a very difficult person to prepare for in one week's time. Lincoln Riley, that is. Especially when it's him and his quarterback are, are in sync. So that's going to be something to really pay attention to uh, in this particular matchup. There's subplots. You know, you have, you know, is it is it Sark versus Lincoln or is it Sark versus Alex Grinch? Is it Lincoln mm-hmm. versus PK, right? So right. There's, there's, there's branches off of that because, but in, holistically, they're the head coaches. And then the head coaches that are mastermind play callers who are quarterback guys and the similarities that we now have. Lincoln Riley is one of the reasons why we had to go get a Steve Sarkeesian. I mean, he he kind of forced our hand with his with their dominance. So here we are for a showcase. Um, speaking of those branches, I think a big part when we talk about introducing the, the other layers, right? So Pete Kwiatkowski as well as Alex Grinch. Areas of opportunity, to me, this game and the way this game has been decided the last few years has really been in the trenches, Mm Tran. And and, and starting with Texas, like you said, we're Texas fans. We gave up, what, 15? The last two years, Sam Ellinger, I believe, was sacked 15 times since Alex Grinch uh, took over as defensive coordinator at Oklahoma. It's well documented how much we've struggled the last couple of years and a lot of blame. That This is when Herb Hand was really getting lit up, right? Because we couldn't handle the twists and the stunts. And that's a staple of what Grinch does. Double A gap pressure when he'll add those linebackers in. He'll man up on one side, zone on the other, man up, you know, cover zero, beat me. And we have struggled with it, Right. Are really, you know, consistently able to move the ball was with Sam's legs, it felt like. What do you see here in terms of the matchup with the Texas offensive line? We know Denzel Okafor. Unfortunately, you were right about his injury, by the way, and he's out for the season now. Uh, but what, what do you see up front in terms of the matchup with the Texas offensive line versus a very, very good, I would say the best defensive front we'll see all year of the uh, Oklahoma defensive line? So one of the good things is week over week, we've improved on run and pass block. So with that said, I, I think that it, it's, it's easy to say that um, the, I, I would give the nod to, um, to Oklahoma's defensive line over our offensive line. 
-hmm. So we need to make sure that we're getting Casey into proper positions to get the ball out quickly, um, to soften it and tire up the defense. Uh, Bijan, we need to block. We need to block for Bijan because those hits behind the line they can they can total up on you and and individually tire you out as a running back. So so um, we're, we're going to have to find ways to get Bijan into space like we did it with uh with with TCU a little swing pass, little little sweep toss, um, little uh, little. They they like to do the little uh, wheel route for him up the up the sideline. Um, then get get. I, I want to see Xavier where they get a quick pass today. I, I want to see him get that confidence in himself because he we didn't we tried to we tried to hit him deep a couple times right away and it didn't work out and it, it just kind of messed up his time in the whole game. So I want to see him get the ball. So. Um, with uh we need to hold up we need to hold up for those two three seconds we need to we need to have the communication on the offensive line on blitz and stunts um i want to see some toughness awesome uh, honestly you know i saw a couple plays where carrick when he stepped in he flatlined a couple guys and that's the kind of like nastiness i want to see this is a this is a rivalry game right like take your anger yeah, out again on your enemy. So. A lot of people been waiting for Carrick, so he's now you know we'll probably see them stick with that lineup of Derek Kerstetter at left guard mm -hmm. filling in for Okafor. Which I like Carrick, that actually. Carrick in there at right tackle, so I think that's a good point of getting some nasty in there, and and you're he's going to need that whether it's Benito, whether it's Isaiah Thomas, mm -hmm. you know the stunts they do. He's going to get they're they're going to roll something to where. Perry on Winfrey mm -hmm. loops out. Um, now, if I'm OU, I would have Perry on Winfrey really go ham on Jake Majors, and I would target that. Um, OU's had a lot of success, and I think this has also impacted why we've uh, struggled to run the football with our running backs against them consistently. I think the last person that went over 100 yards from Texas that was a runner, um, not, not Sam Ellinger, was probably Foreman. Um, I haven't just, just off the top of my head. I don't think there was anybody else that, that broke 100 yards as a, as a running back. But a big issue with that is Neville Gallimore was blowing up Zach Shackelford. Winfrey. Kenneth Murray was filling know, gaps. Kenneth Murray yeah. was, was – right, right. All that yeah. – we that interior pressure was an issue, right? Now, we are more of outside zone, and mm -hmm. then we're, we're starting to make that more of a staple – we tried to get there with Mike Kiersich, didn't have the time, but that's now becoming more of our staple. So how does that look against this particular front? Are, and I, I do expect Steve Sarkeesian to have uh, some stuff dialed up to deal with Grinch's pressures. Uh, because if I'm Alex Grinch, I know I know a few things, right? I know everything's going to revolve around B. John Robinson, whether it's run or pass. He's the, mm -hmm. the, the focal point. He's the star. And I know that they have they have shown nothing on tape that gives me confidence that that they can consistently hit deep passes. Mm -hmm. That's a weakness of Texas. Until Texas proves, we've had people open, but we have hit none of them. Whether it's Hudson Card, whether it's Casey Thompson, they, we've we've been, timings have been off, poor passes, people not making plays on the ball, what have you. Right? We are our, our efficiency throwing the ball. Deep downfield has been poor. If I'm OU, test me. Test me. Because what you just said about Xavier Worthy in the quick game and the stuff over the middle, now the over the middle stuff's going to be interesting because when, when OU's not bringing heat, they do like to play a lot of two-man, right? Man underneath, two high safeties. So the, the beaters, typically against two-man, are in breaking routes, which is a strength of Casey Thompson for the most part. And that's something that Skylar Thompson seemed to have a lot of success with last week. The, the guy was with one leg, and I don't know Skylar Thompson to be a passer, yet he threw for 300 yards because they kept beating him with that. Now, I don't think – I think Alex Grinch is going to adjust and try to take that away. And if I'm, if I'm Alex Grinch, Tran, I'm saying beat me deep and beat me to the outside, Casey Thompson. Prove it. 
and I'm and and the rest of it is resources allocated to try to slow down the run. Now the beauty of it is TCU allocated a bunch of resources to slow down the run, and Bijan Robinson wasn't having none still, of that. Yeah, he's still he's like, hey, you know, and I'll still drop two hundred on you. <laughs> still drop two hundred on you. Um, but in regards to the offensive line, I mean, I know we started talking scheme, but going back to the offensive line, I mean, if they can give us something, at least get going in the run blocking game, mm-hmm. then I can build my play action. I can, you know, I can scheme up easier beaters. You know, we, we scored on an RPO last week, right? So there's some things that I think we could potentially mix well, in that, that, that could mitigate the, the pressure that I know. Oh, you will bring to test us because we have not passed that test in two years since Alex Grinch has been the defensive coordinator. Yeah, before we flip over to our the defensive line versus mm-hmm. there, I mean, this is honestly why we went out and paid for Kyle Flood. Mm. They, I mean, Del Conte saw the uh, he saw he saw the uh, he saw the past two years of Sam repeat that again, fifteen sacks in. Two games. That's unacceptable. With all the talent that Texas can can bring in, that's unacceptable to have fifteen sacks. Your quarterback can't get hit that much, like no. And then we were also asking him to run 20, 25 times. Mm-hmm. Uh, God so bless Sam Ellinger because he, he he's I a mean, warrior. He because he was a warrior was the reason why we were even remotely in that game in those yeah. games. Well, I mean, the year the year before, the score was was not as close as it was. The game wasn't as close as the score indicated. Yeah. And then last season, he literally just he willed us. He willed us, yeah. and and Oklahoma fell asleep at the will in the fourth quarter as well when they had a big lead. But he willed us and just started going crazy. But that can't be. That's not sustainable. That type of offense, mm-hmm. right? Like they took us. They they essentially took away everything we really wanted to do. So to, to, to counteract that, you're going to have to have some beaters and the offensive line is going to have to hold up, hold up enough to where I can call some of those, those beaters because there is a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity. West Virginia took it, man. Every team they've played outside of Western Carolina, those teams have had success at some point in the game offensively against this defense where a lot of people, myself included, thought coming in the season, this is the best OU defense they're going to have. They've got all the recruits. They've got everything going. I think they only got one pressure on Skylar Thompson last week. So you know they're they're being challenged right now on, you know, as much as they as much success as they had slowing down Deuce Vaughn in the run department, because Deuce Vaughn still had 100 yards receiving. It, it, it's interesting that they weren't able to generate pressure on Skylar Thompson. So I'm sure those guys are going to be tasked with getting it going this week because those are some of the best football players they have on their team. I think Nick Benito is probably the best player they have, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I, I hold Nick Benito in a higher regard than I do Ronnie Perkins. Just, just my opinion. I know somebody may come on here and disagree, but like they've got to get it going is my point. And, um, you know, all hands on deck against Texas this week. Now on the flip side, Shout out to Mark Vasquez. Flip side of this, oh, you struggled mightily on the offensive line. When's the last time we came into a Texas OU game where our guy had 600 something yards rushing already and their guy only has like 300? Now, granted, their guy's splitting time with Eric Gray, but their yards per carry is okay, but they're not popping off. They haven't had a 100 yard rusher yet this season. I'm used to such a balanced attack, a balanced breakfast from Lincoln Riley, and to see the challenges that they've had trying to run the football consistently. They're, they they struggled a lot last week. And the challenges they've had blocking for Spencer Rattler. This is an area of opportunity for Texas and Pete Kwiatkowski, Tran. 100%. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up PK because – we saw what Alex Grinch did for for OU's offense when he when he stepped in right away. And the defense, he, he yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Sorry, defense. Uh, he um, he completely flipped flipped the tables. I I felt very comfortable with 
with our offense versus their defense until he came in. What is PK going to do? You know, what is he going to bring to the table that's that's going to throw off their their vaunted offense? You know, you know, you know they're going to score, but how are we going to be opportunistic against them? Mm. You know, um, how how are we going to utilize? Like, I I know we everyone loved that formation that we had that little diamond formation where where uh, I think Colburn was the linebacker and we all rushed the quarterback, but yeah. And Collins got a sack. Yeah. Collins got a sack because no one knew their blocking assignment on who they're supposed to go against. So what is he going to do for this game? You know, he's got something in it, up his sleeve. Um, I, we need to see that to, uh, to see how that's going to flip in our favor for the game. Our defensive line, we need to step up. You know, we need to get pressure. We need to n- step on the throat because this is the, the uh, this is the probably the worst offensive line I've seen for OU in years. You know, they they're so lucky that they've they've been on the the uh, Outland. Is it the Outland? We're the best mm-hmm. offensive line. Yeah, even with going back even last year when they had Creed Humphrey, who's yeah. now on the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, uh, they, they've always had they've always had a well in recent history they've always had a very strong offensive line. So we need to we need to exploit it. We need to exploit the the issues that they've had, the blocking issues on uh, for for uh, run run blocking. I'm seeing I'm seeing Spencer Rattler having to scramble, which the, he's not a, a scrambling quarterback. Hopefully that makes him make bad decisions, and we need to be opportunistic, and we need to capitalize on any turnovers. Um, we need to keep their running backs within within in check that they've been that way. We we usually there's a stat that the team that wins the rushing battle usually wins this game. I think it, at one point it it was undefeated for for the for the early two thousands. I know it's probably flipped since then, but but I would like to be the team that controls the ball, keep their keep their offense off. So, what is PK going to do? What is our defensive line going to do to to exploit that that the weakness that they have? Yeah, last year um, it was frustrating because I felt good about this going into last year's game. We know Kennedy Brooks had opted out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson at that time was suspended. We went up against. And I think McGowan, when I think he had a concussion or whatever. So we we had a situation where we went against TJ Pledger and Marcus Major. And they went off against us. Pledger, Pledger went for a buck 30 and two touchdowns. Marcus Major had another touchdown, almost 50 yards on the ground. And that was very frustrating because that was essentially, I mean, even t- talk about Trey Sermon transferring earlier that offseason, like those guys were like the fourth and fifth tailbacks and they were still gashing us. So, and that's not just the defensive line for Texas. That was a whole defensive effort, right? Like that, I don't want to put that all on the defensive line, but when the offensive line for OU has struggled the way that they're struggling, and I've seen some of the successes that Kansas state, West Virginia, you, you know, even Tulane at certain points, not that they were really slowing them down, but just certain things they were doing, whether it was run blitzes or certain tactics to get underneath offensive linemen, to get underneath pulling guards and make plays. Um, this is this is where my head is at. I'm not – I love my big boys. But this may be the game where I have more Byron Murphy, more of my disruptors. More of the guys that are just going to get off blocks, get underneath guys, and cause piles, right? I, I, I this may not be the game where under uh, obviously in short yardage situations and certain packages, I'm going to need Sweat, Coburn, what have you. But I might be inclined to go more Ojimo, Murphy, Collins. You know, even you know Vernon. Oh. Depending on what Vernon Broughton I get, because he's been up and down too. Um, some of the more athletic type guys. I would, I would even throw a Gofu on the edge. On the edge? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Um, disruptors, man. Mm-hmm. Like, because even, even in the TCU game, right? I mean, 
there's rumors that because because the big talking point with TCU fans this week is why did Zach Evans only have 15 carries when he was averaging eight yards a carry? Like that's been on message boards. I've been seeing it all over Twitter. Gary Patterson said the brother was tired. They said there's some sort of conditioning issue. That's what I've heard. I'm not saying that's true. I'm, I, I don't know what the story is. But if I'm OU and I'm seeing the way TCU was gashing Texas with their runner, like I think Kennedy Brooks could do some of those same things. I think Eric Gray can do some of those same things, right? And so I now need to take a look. If I'm Pete Kwiatkowski, if I'm Bo Davis at my personnel in this game, Sorrell as well. Some of these younger guys, and I know they're young and inexperienced, and this is a big, big spot, but I got to play the people that have been producing. I've seen Baron Sorrell produce, right? And some of these older heads that 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 have been taking up snaps, I haven't seen them flash the way I've seen the young boys flash. And that goes for the interior. I have not seen them flash the way I've seen Byron Murphy flash, all being in limited snaps. So I'm very curious to see what that rotation is going to look like, um, you know, to hopefully help out our linebackers in this game. Our linebackers are going to need to tackle better in space as well. Uh, But they're going to have a lot of responsibilities with the tight end, dealing with Austin Stogner, all these receivers all over the place because OU still has a lot of weapons. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm putting a lot of this on the defensive line and being disruptive. Who can get home against Spencer Rattler and force mistakes? We know he can put the ball on the carpet when he's under the rest. We know we've seen him make bad decisions. We saw it against us. So who who, who are the disruptors? Those are the people that need to be on the field. Because if we go with status quo, we'll mess around and, and this will be the game that OU gets back over 100 yards. And they get they start looking like the Lincoln-Riley run game that they've always had. So we have to avoid that, I, I feel like, in this in this particular game. So so my counterpoint is, is we need them all, honestly, because those disruptors, honestly, uh, if you look at – the times of the game that they actually disrupted, it was it was later on in the game when the big guys are tiring out the other big guys. So if you're just saying just throw them out there as the starters right away, uh, you may you may not see that produ- that same production. So That's we fair. we we do need every single one, all hands on deck, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. No, uh, but seriously. Uh, I'm not – and people have asked me, are you going to give up on your boy, Coburn? Hell no. I'm not giving up on him. Can't give up on a guy who's who's produced earlier. He's probably still just learning the scheme. You know, I, I would th- – uh, my idea was he would play a, a Vita Vea type of player in PK's offense – I mean defense. But he hasn't, he hasn't played that yet. So he's still learning, I think. I think the, the complexities of, of his defense – may be confusing to him. You got to think this is his third defense in three years that he's having to learn. Um, say, same thing with uh, uh, Sweat as well. You know, Jacoby Jones seems to have, have clicked. Yeah, with it's, it. clicking, it's starting yeah. to click for Jacoby Jones. I so, uh, so, I mean, let's we have, we have to let them play. You know, you, you can't just say, oh, he, you know, I give up on him because of four games. Four games, he hasn't produced three sacks or something like that. So, um, but yeah, we we're gonna need it. We're gonna need a lot of we're gonna need a lot of rotating bodies in there. And it, with with the way that their offensive line has been producing, you know, I, I like the fact of our depth just hitting them in waves, hitting them in waves, and then you know, being like I said, being opportunistic and making sure that if we break, if we have the right alignment on what we need. We make them. We make them pay. We get. We get it where rad, rattle rattler is rattled. You know. So that's what I'm looking for. Ojemal graded very very highly, um, and you know I'm, I'm, you know, PFF grades. You take them with a grain of salt sometimes because some of them just don't make any sense to mm-hmm. what you actually see. Uh, but Ojemal graded, I think, as high as anybody on Texas last week. So um, he's also – and I saw him making plays and flashing. My thing with, with Keandre Coburn, I'm not saying I'm giving up on him, but I yeah. am saying it's a meritocracy, and at some point I need my most productive players on the field. My thing with Coburn is this, and my challenge to him is this. Make your presence felt. 
Mm-hmm. I've never, I've never been the guy to grade most interior guys, unless you're a three tech that's like explosive, like a Warren Sapp or Aaron Donald. I don't grade them on sacks. I grade you on disruption. Mm-hmm. I need to see you screwing shit up. I need you to see getting those interior pressures and dictating the pocket. I need to see you in certain points when you're getting double team, getting a stalemate at the line of scrimmage and forcing a cutback. Or, or There's what, no stat for that, watch. but I see you dictating and making your presence felt in the interior. I have not seen any of that. Yeah, yeah, that's so, the problem. So watch the. Um, did you watch Tampa Bay's game last night? Tampa Bay. Yes. Yes. Did you see that one play where the the linebacker got the sack because Vita Vea slanted to the right and took out two people? Push, push the le- uh, left tackle off balance. There's no stat for that. Yes, for there's no – you, right. you're looking for stuff like that where you're, you're just eating apart the line and letting letting everyone else eat. And that's what I'm looking for too. Everybody, that, that's when you start to see a whole bunch of other people getting sacks. Mm-hmm. It's because of th- that big boy. And, and I, I'm g- so happy you used that example because that's what li- that's, that's why Vita Vea is one of the most valuable players in the NFL right now. To the point where me as a Dallas Cowboy fan, I watched us in our opening game against Tampa Bay with the quarterback in his first game back after everything Dak Prescott went through. We asked Dak Prescott to throw the ball 60 times. <laughs> we didn't even bother running it. And no one disagreed with the game plan. Because everyone, just, even fans watching the game were like, if you run the ball against these guys up the middle, it's a waste of a down. Yeah, it's two, it's two yards a carry. So New England saying. figured that out last night. First half, New England's trying to run the ball. They finished with negative one. Mm-hmm. And what they do the rest of the game, Mac Jones, we spreading it out. Our run game is is it's you know dink and dunk pass, yeah, dink and dunk. That's our run game because it's pointless trying to run against this this front. And I'm not saying we have to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers up front and all this type of stuff, but I want to. I mean, yeah, ideally. I mean, because that's what George is doing. Yeah. With Jordan Davis and those boys, but there's levels to this. And, but that's what it's that's what it could look like in, in some realm or capacity in terms of what we're asking for and how you grade it. There's no stat for that. But when you watch the tape and you see the game, it's like they can't move this guy. <laughs> And he's screwing up everything, right? To the point where I, as a play caller, you just throw that whole sheet of plays out like we had to do. So that's what we're looking to see. Last point is this. And this is the big, big picture because we're a big picture channel as well. SEC. SEC. Is this the last hurrah in the Cotton Bowl for this game? Now, we know they said, what, 2025 and all this stuff. And we, we know... I'm still not convinced that we're, that that we're going to be in. I'm still not convinced we're going to be in this conference even as early as next season. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not. Like I'll. Be, it's like one of those things where I believe it when I see it. Maybe, but I think this is going to be interesting because this is the two teams we've talked about our first two previews: the energy against Texas Tech, right? Now knowing the news, first time on the road, now knowing the news, how badly people want. Uh, to derail that. To, in fairness to both of these teams, they're coming in 4-0 in the conference. So now they get to play each other. I think it's going to be an interesting energy because we know we're going to be together for the long mm-hmm. term um, in, in keeping this game, Texas and OU. Uh, but I, I do think it's an interesting outlook, and I'm sure it's going to be a main talking point for the uh, the college game day crew when they come to Dallas. Absolutely. Um, I, I personally think that if we win this game, we'll we'll have one more meeting, and that's that's in the that's the in the Big Twelve championship. championship. I'm not as convinced if we lose this game, we will be in the Big Twelve championship because I I don't know that we still have to go to West Virginia, we still have to go to Iowa State, um, we have to play a, a a respectable Oklahoma State team, which I think is undefeated and they're number yes. twelve in the nation. Um, luckily that's at home though. Uh, but you know, we still, they, they have to play the same teams as well. So it's not, it's not just us. Don't, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, it's, it's OUs until someone overthrows them. 
Facts. And they still Until have. Until somebody takes the yeah, crown. They still have all the talent in the world, and they still have Alex Grinch, and they still have uh, Lincoln Riley. So I feel if we win this, this will be a this will be a huge confidence booster too. Because I think this is this this is a little bit different team than the one that we beat uh, than the one that we beat in 2018. They don't have the same exact explosion explosive players that they have that they had in 2018. They had Hollywood Brown. They had C.D. Lamb. They had wow. Kyler Murray. Like so, but yeah, they didn't they didn't necessarily have a great defense. So they, I, I feel like this team is more balanced. But I think this is this team is beatable as well. And I think this is, team is a beatable team twice. You know, I don't think that the uh, the OU team in 2018 is be uh, you could you could beat them twice. That was our whole point that season. Yeah. Uh, and if anybody ever wants to go back and watch those videos, I think we said that pretty consistently, um, and, and which is why we nailed those predictions when I felt as though then. This is a moment of clarity and honesty. I knew going into the even the first game in 2018 when Dicker made the field goal to win. I didn't feel like we were the better team going into the game. I felt like we were going to win the game. I felt like we were close. But if we're talking about personnel, I thought OU was a better team. I just felt like we were catching them at the right time. I really like what I had seen in, I think it was the USC game earlier that year, like what was building. And I thought we could use that momentum <laughs> To, to get him. And we got a big in that game. We got a big. But we also saw how good and how explosive they were with how quickly they got back right in the mm -hmm. game, right? But we also picked them to lose in the Big 12 Championship game because it's like this team, it's not a team you beat twice. And, and, and sometimes that's just the way it works with personnel. I'm with you. This year, the way if we take away the rankings and the numbers, you can't tell me on tape. The thing, what hurts Texas, if you, and I hate to put it this way, is it's the Arkansas game. Because if, if you, if you, if that's the data point that's screwing everything up. Because if, if you look at the other games that these teams have played, like let's take Texas's worst game, which is Arkansas. And let's say OU's worst game is either Tulane or West Virginia. Pick one, but leave the other. If you take the f other four games that Texas has won and the other four games OU has has played, there's no – Texas looks like the better football team, all four of those games, than, than, than in comparison to how OU has looked in terms of execution, self-inflicted mistakes, drama, right? Texas has looked like the better football team four out of the five games they've played in comparison to OU. The thing is OU's – figured out how to win all five and we got obliterated in Fayetteville. Right. But one could argue, Hey, that's where we found ourselves. And that changed the momentum of the season. We'll see so far. So good. But I don't feel the way I felt in 2018 where I'm like, Oh, that's just like, we almost have to be perfect uh -huh. to, to beat this. Team. I, I don't feel that way at all. I like both of these teams are flawed and that's really the only two, the only two teams in college football right now. There's, 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 there's a gap right now. It's Alabama and Georgia, and then yeah, Iowa State's DBs are boy, ham. I get it, but Penn State, eh, Iowa, eh, Oklahoma, eh, you know, and then and then and then it's like Cincinnati, right? Like you can make arguments Cincinnati's better than some of those teams. Mm -hmm. Like that's where we are in college football right now. So. I don't see any reason to to not feel like Texas is the better team in this game. Am I am I crazy? No, you're not crazy at all. Um, it's it's out right right now in my eyes. It's Alabama and everyone else. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the way I see it. You know, I'm I, adding Georgia in there because Georgia's oh yeah yeah defense, Georgia 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 Georgia's okay. defense. I know the offense that you know. JT Daniels only played like two games or whatever, but like their defense is so good. So good. It's so good. It's, it's, they're, they're very good. Um, and, and I didn't mean to, to, to leave them out, but oh, it's, no worries. it's, and, you know, every they'll, other they'll team have is to play beatable. at some point. They'll have yeah. to, yeah. they're going to have to, they're going to have to face off, but every other team is beatable, you know, and you can't judge like if, if, if we're talking about the, 
Arkansas game, I've told this to a lot of people who are like, oh, man, we, we really suck. We lost by 21 points to Arkansas. You know, the first test was like, you can't judge a team by the second game of the season. You can't. You have to use that as a measuring stick. That's why it's it's non-conference play. And that's why we actually take on the harder tests of non-conference play to prep us. So I feel like our trajectory is, you know, it's it's still undetermined because we still we still got a lot of growing to do. There's a lot of th- things to fix. And I think if we do, you know, by the time, hopefully, we get to the Big 12 championship. I don't want to just say, you know, when we get to the Big 12 championship. But uh, by the time we get there, you know, hope, hopefully we are a made team. We are a focused team. We are a team that everyone's talking about that, hey, they can compete in the in the, in the the playoffs. Look how they've transformed yes. throughout the season. Look how they, you know, look how guys have emerged on mm-hmm. their team that may not have been talked about at the beginning of the season. I think that's when you see a team have that same upward trajectory that we saw Oklahoma have last year, mm-hmm. right? Where exactly. they found themselves. So that's, I think that's what I, I, I'm with you that we could potentially see from this Texas team. And we know Oklahoma is looking for that same boost. Yeah, the same shot in the arm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, that's a common thing for both teams. And, um, you know, you know, the SEC is already going to take credit for, for having this marquee game. On their sides. <laughs> marquee game at 11 o'clock in the morning. Right, right, right. Um, we're going to have a lot of content. Texas, we just wanted to go storylines. And um, we're going to have some OU fans on the channel this week. Tran is going to be out traveling. So I just wanted to have him on just, just to wrap real quick. Tran, do you want to give a prediction right now, or do you want to come on at some point, or what do you want to do? Do you? Because I know we didn't. This wasn't a traditional preview, or you can wait. It's up to you. Uh, I'll, you I'll hold off. Okay, I'll hold off uh, because I, honestly, I haven't really dug into every single position like we normally do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know their players. You know, we we, we watch, watch them so much. We wa- yeah. yeah, but it's going going matchup by matchup. It's it's a little bit more granular than than just oh yeah it's gonna be 42 35 we're good <laughs> bucket well uh we'll be back with more um you guys will get the announcements as i announce who the guest will be this week uh but we have some is very, there a very... prop bet on busr <laughs> for uh there there is uh so I uh there there are some bets on on, on BUSR so look up there check them out hit us up uh thank you to our sponsors busr.com slash fanatic sports 100 fp contest is coming details on their way we appreciate you guys so very much for for rocking with us and um yeah let us know in the comments what you think are the big, big, big storylines, anything we missed or anything that you think should be highlighted. We appreciate it. Guys, remember, big week. Horns always up.